All right, a very good evening to everyone. Um, it's 7.30, so it's time again for another LVS film reading session. This is our delayed uh, September session, so thank you all for joining me this evening. Uh, for those of you who are new to these sessions, a very quick introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Ian, and I'm a radiologist. Um, I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College back in 2004. Um, I got my RCVS imaging certificate in 2009, and I went back to the RVC to do my imaging residency in 2013, which I completed in 2016. I finally got my European diploma in 2018. And these days, uh, you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is the only multidisciplinary referral hospital in central London. Um, if you do need a hand um, with anything imaging related, if you have some radiographs that you'd like to have a chat about, or if you would like to discuss the uh, best possible imaging modality to use um, when working at the case, then feel free to drop me a line via the email um, or give me a call at the clinic. So uh, one of the things that we like to do during these sessions is um, initially to just look at an example and uh, additionally it's a case taken from the previous film reading session and this is exactly that. So this is a two-year-old female neutered ragdoll cat that presented with chronic vomiting. Uh, so as this is an example I'm just going to look at um, a single radiograph. Um, last month um, I think we looked at the complete series um, which consisted of um, orthogonal views of this cat's thorax. So we've just got the right lateral view to look at um, this evening, and hopefully you guys can appreciate that this cat's esophagus um, is much bigger than it should be. Um, so we've got a couple of linear opacities um, within the dorsocaudal thorax that we wouldn't expect to see, and those linear opacities represent the dorsal and the ventral walls of the esophagus. And if we follow them cranially, um, we can see that um, really all of this cat's esophagus is much larger than it should be. Um, but if we look in a little bit more detail, we can see that rather than this being a generalized esophageal dilatation, um, it has a bit of a segmental quality because we've got two different portions of the esophagus that look to be dilated. We've got a cranial portion of the thoracic esophagus, and then we've got a more caudal portion of the thoracic esophagus. If we follow that dilated cranial segment caudally, then it appears to taper um, just cranial to the cardiac silhouette um, and then get really big again. Now, um, that segmental esophageal dilatation was mirrored um, in the other views, and as this is a, a young cat um, that is um, having um, gastrointestinal problems and has regurgitation, then we need to think about um, potential uh, congenital abnormalities that might result in this sort of uh, segmental esophageal dilatation. And uh, things to consider would be um, something like um, persistent ligamentum arteriosum. Um, that's certainly something that would result in a uh, narrowing or um, not necessarily a, a structure, but a compression of the esophagus, um, just cranial to the cardiac silhouette um, and other types of congenital problems. So uh, congenital vascular abnormalities that can result in the compression of the esophagus. Um, and there are a whole bunch of them. Um, the most common uh, would be something like um, a persistent right uh, aortic arch. And in those cases, uh, typically um, the esophagus um, and the trachea is displaced um, over to the uh, left hand side because of that aortic arch that's on the right that shouldn't be there. Um, and there are a whole bunch of um, other congenital abnormalities as well, um, ranging, um, I think, from one to, to seven. Um, the, the first three have a persistent right aortic arch. And then four, and four has a double arch, and then five through seven have a normal aortic arch. Um, but they have other changes um, like epististant ligamentum arteriosum um, or potentially um, aberrant rights of clavian. So, yeah, that was a case from last week. And if you'd like to look at the other views, um, then they are available online on the website. Um, we did have a little chat about this last week. Um, so, that's our example. Um, and um, we don't have a diagnosis um, for this case. Um, but certainly the narrowing of the esophagus uh, just cranial to the cardiac silhouette was confirmed in this cat uh, via endoscopy. So um, that's uh, our example, um, which brings us on to uh, case number one, um, which is a four month old male entire doberman um, that's presented to you as coughing. And we've got a couple of radiographs 
to look at. Um, we've got a uh, lateral radiograph, and this is a right lateral radiograph, and we've got a left lateral radiograph of the thorax, and we've got a dorsal ventral radiograph of the thorax. So a complete thoracic series for this uh, young, four month old male entire Doberman. So yeah, um, does anybody fancy um, just sharing their thoughts on uh, what might be going on um, in this young Doberman? And as with all of these film reading sessions, um, this is not an exam and this patient has already been in and been diagnosed and been treated. Um, so yeah, this is uh, just a bit of fun. Really. And the more you get involved, the more you can get involved. I'll, I'll have a go. Great. <laughs> OK, so obviously it's, a, it's a lateral thoracic um, radiograph. Um, so um, in the region of the heart, um, we, we can see um, a structure from about what the third to roughly the fifth, sixth. Um, it, it looks like a cardiac like structure, but caudal to that, there's another um, circular, uh, well, it's sort of like um, a, a, it's, um, an oblong shaped, sorry, I can't get it more technical than that, an oblong shaped structure, which is similar to the structure structure of the heart, but it okay. looks like it's separate to it. Okay. And um, the, the lung, we can see the trachea quite clearly, um, but the, there's, there's a very obvious um, lung pattern. I would say that we can obviously I'd say there's a bronchial pattern. I'd say maybe it's 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 kind of mixed. I think we've got air bronchograms there. Okay. Um, so I'd say it's maybe kind of like a mixed pattern. Okay. Um, if we go on to the abdomen, um, we can see um, the diaphragm, and we can see um, on the other view, or um, on the other view, I think we could see some radio opaque material possibly in the stomach. Uh, maybe yeah, yeah. Just, yeah video period in the stomach and and it looks like there is possibly some foods in the stomach yep. um so uh, my guess is the dog's got some sort of aspiration pneumonia um but i can't completely explain the second structure causal to the heart uh, this this the sort of soft tissue capacity kind of here yes here okay. yeah there. yeah yeah okay no, absolutely um yeah uh i Absolutely agree with a lot of your radiographic findings. Um, there certainly is some change to the pulmonary parenchyma here, and those changes are um, most uh, severe, most prominent um, in the uh, the caudal and ventral thorax and um, between the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragm. And because we've got this increase in opacity in in that region, um, we've got some effacement of the borders of the diaphragm. Here. So. Dorsally, we can see the margins of the left and the right cruise, but as we extend ventrally, um, it, it's difficult to make those out. So there's definitely something going on um, in this quarter ventral thorax um, between the cardiac silhouette um, and the diaphragm. And there's a few other bits and pieces to mention, um, particularly in this dorsal ventral view. So, uh, one of the things that's uh, most striking about um, this view is, is how tricky it is to see the cardiac silhouette um, and also uh, to see the margins of the diaphragm. Um, so uh, we have got this increase in soft tissue opacity um, in uh, the, the mid thorax, which most likely represents the cardiac silhouette, um, but it's really difficult to make it out. Um, certainly the margins of the cardiac silhouette, particularly towards the apex, um, are very effaced and we're not really able to see those at all and we can see the lateral margins of the diaphragm but as we move towards um, the mid thorax um, again it's very difficult to make out um, where the diaphragm starts um, and where it ends. There's a few other features here as well that might clue us into um, why we've got this border effacement of the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragm. So um, if we look at the uh, lung lobes and, and we try and remember exactly what lung, lung lobes there are and what separates them. Um, we can see that there are a couple of little fissure lines here. Um, so we've got the right cranial lung lobe just here um, and there's um, a curved linear opacity um, separating the right cranial lung lobe um, from the right middle lung lobe. And there's also a little linear opacity 
often the left bit, just separating the left cranial from the left caudal. So there's certainly some fissure lines present in this DV view, and also this effacement of the cardiac silhouette and the margins of the diaphragm. Those fissure lines are, are a bit more tricky to make out in the lateral views. And if we look at this right lateral view, then maybe we can convince ourselves that there's a little fissure line just here. Um, there is a structure that we see um, in uh, no, uh, normal thoracic radiographs, um, which is called the cranial mediastinal reflection that separates the cranial lung lobes, and that can sometimes look a little bit like a fissure line. And I think that might be what this <coughs> linear opacity is just here. But we wouldn't normally expect to see anything uh, linear and opaque, just cranial to the cardiac silhouette in the craniventral thorax here. And I wonder if that's a little fissure line. So um, the fact that we've got effacement of the cardiac silhouette and the margins of the diaphragm in the lateral views, because in the left lateral view as well, it, it's pretty tricky to see the diaphragm. Um, and we've got some fissure lines, um, then we should be thinking about the sort of um, pathologies that can cause that. And the most common thing that could cause that would be the existence of some pleural effusion. Um, so um, I'd be suspicious of there being a pleural effusion here, as well as there being um, uh, a pneumonia. Um, so uh, you mentioned that uh, you felt that the changes to the pulmonary parenchyma were um, most severe in the um, caudal ventral thorax um, between the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragm. And, and, and I absolutely agree. I, I think in both the lateral views, um, we've got this increase in soft tissue opacity, um, just sort of, again, making it very difficult to see um, the Cordal vena cava and um, kind of facing the margins of those structures. This this right lateral view is is kind of tricky, and, and I think what what's happening here um, is this is this is quite an expiratory view. Um, so we've not got any T tube here in this view, so we can we presume that um, this dopamine means either conscious or likely sedated for um, this radiographic study. And um, the margins of the diaphragm that we can see um, look really quite convex. And um, as you pointed out, the capacity of the pulmonary parenchyma is increased slightly. So um, I think this view is, is quite expiratory. Um, and I think what, what we're seeing here is um, a, a combination of this very expiratory view pushing the very convex margins of the diaphragm cranially and the and part of the liver essentially pushed up against the cardiac the cardiac silhouette here and all of that being mixed up by the fact that we've got this increase in opacity um, of the lung between the heart um, and the diaphragm. So I, I think that's probably a bit of a, this, this thing here but I do agree that this this part of the thorax is, is very abnormal. So here we, we can see the margins of the diaphragm a little bit more clearly and we can see where the liver starts and where the thorax um, starts as well. So we can see the margin of the diaphragm a little bit better. Uh, so and the other thing to pick up on, I suppose, was um, kind of pulmonary patterns and, and they're very, they're very tricky pulmonary patterns. Um, I, I'm not absolutely convinced I can see any any abronchograms here. Um, I think there's there's certainly an increase in interstitial opacity and I think it has a, a ventral distribution, um, particularly um, in that region of the lung between the cardiac silhouette and the margin of the diaphragm. So, so this bit, um, I mean, I guess maybe that's an abronchogram, but but they're quite tricky to see. And, and if, if you see abronchograms, then you can describe the pattern as um, alveolar. Um, if there's abronchograms, then the lung has to be consolidated. Otherwise, you wouldn't see the abronchograms. And um, we can call it an alveolar pattern if you can't see um, abronchograms. Um, but uh, it's, it's difficult to see the pulmonary structures adjacent to the change. So if you're struggling to see the pulmonary vasculature, for example, um, then you can call it an interstitial, uh, the interstitial pattern. And that, that's probably how I uh, describe this as the heavy interstitial. Um, in terms of the, the bronchi, uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree that maybe some of these bronchi walls are a little bit thick, but this, this isn't a great series of radiographs, and um, both of these lateral views are a bit expiratory. Um, so I'd, I'd be focusing on the fact that there's this um, heavy interstitial opacity within the cord of ventral thorax between the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragm, and we've got some changes that are compatible with um, a pleural effusion. So we've got um, effacement of the margins of the cardiac silhouette, all views to a greater or lesser extent, and we've got um, some pleural fissure lines visible. 
So something like um, a pneumonia, um, like a pleural pneumonia, um, would, would absolutely be um, top of the differential list here. This is a pretty young dog, um, and it's something um, infectious um, or parasitic, I suppose, um, would be top of the differential list. Um, so um, an infectious um, pleural pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia, uh, we probably couldn't completely rule out lungworm, although the distribution of the changes here is um, not typical for lungworm. So, so lungworm, the changes are typically peripheral. So they tend to occur around the edges of the thorax um, rather than um, here um, in the cordoventral thorax. Um, so yeah, um, I like the description and, and I like the differentials. Um, so something like uh, pneumonia, um, pleural pneumonia, infectious, certainly on the differential list. Um, I guess the only other thing to consider would be whether or not this dog could have um, a foreign body, like a, a bronchial foreign body, um, it certainly wouldn't be a typical location. Um, so if, if if this is the area that we're concerned about, then this, this would be the accessory lung lobe here. And um, you, you can get um, bronchial foreign bodies that affect the accessory lung lobe, but um, typically they're more the cordial lung lobes. And it, um, in my experience, they're more dorsal, so you, you'll find them in this sort of area um, down here in the accessory lung lobe. But um, certainly it's on the differentialist as well. Okay, so uh, this dog had a CT. Um, so we can take a look at the CT. So let me just start running that for you. Um, so for those of you who are not used to uh, looking at uh, CT scans, um, this uh, is a 2.5 millimeter, I believe, lung reconstruction. Um, we're looking at transverse images, going to start cranially, and we're going to move cordially. Um, and just at the present time, we're at about the level of the shoulders. So these are the shoulders here. So let's take a little run through this dog's thorax. So we're just getting to the lung. So stop it there. So we're just starting to see the lung here. So we've got the, the left cranial lung lobe and we've got the right cranial lung lobe. So this is the trachea, if you see it. And we'll run it all the way back to the level that we were concerned about, which was the accessory lung lobe. It's just good. Just let it run through again, which is just here. So let's get the laser pointer back. So this is this is the accessory lung lobe here. So this is, <coughs> excuse me, the um, the right caudal and this is the left caudal lung lobe, <coughs> and that's the accessory lung lobe, lung lobe in the centre. And uh, there absolutely are some semi bronchograms here. So we get a better view of them just there. So there's a very nice uh, a bronchogram just just here. So that's telling us that there is some consolidation in that accessory lung lobe. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, there is some alveolar change here. So the CT um, essentially confirms uh, the suspicions that we had on the radiographs that um, there's um, some infiltrate um, within that accessory lung lobe. Um, it has um, a ventral distribution, and um, I wasn't able to pick up a foreign body um, in this CT scan. So. We look at the accessory lobar bronchus and we follow it into the accessory lung lobe. We can see that it branches quite nicely um, and uh, no evidence of a grass or, or anything sinister uh, within that accessory lobar bronchus. So the working diagnosis for this dog was that this was a, a pneumonia um, and probably an infectious lung. Um, <laughs> excuse me, we can't completely rule out the fact that there could still be a foreign body here, but I think it's much less likely. So yeah, nice job. This um, doggy, uh, yeah, had an accessory lung lobe pneumonia. Um, so yeah, nice work. Okay, anybody have any questions at all about uh, case number one? <coughs> Excuse me. And if you have questions, um, you can ask them via the chat um, if you're feeling a little bit shy um, and you're going to want to um, speak uh, to the rest of the group. If not, then we will move on. To case Sorry, number two. Ian, can, yeah. can, can I have a question? I mean, on the lateral, it looks mm. like you cannot see any, you know, air bronchogram there. <laughs> can I and see it any? looks like, no, any air bronchogram. Yeah, I agree. And also on the DV, I mean, it, it, it's really difficult. It looks like, it looks like almost 
I don't know, there is sort of a dilation of the codal media asylum or... So I don't know, it's, it, it's really tricky, I think, to... Are you looking at this, this sort of, this margin yeah. here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think I think because this this is a Doberman, it's it's a really deep chested dog. <laughs> so there's there's going to be some margins as a result of um, some of the um, the ventral musculature, like like the pectorals, and, and we've got a margin coming down here, um, and then um, a margin here as well. And, and I wonder whether or not um, those are just the the overlying soft tissues. Um, one of the things that well, an, an easy, easy mistake to make with um, these sorts of dorsal ventral radiographs in these very deep chested dogs is that these margins created by um, the soft tissues and by the pectoral muscles, for example, they, excuse me, they, they create differentials in the opacity um, between uh, the um, adjacent parts of the lung. Um, so, so here you could potentially look at this and go, well, this, this part of the right caudal lung lobe um, looks uh, more radially loosened than the, um, the lung that's adjacent to it. Is, is this is this a lung edge, and um, is is this a part of the right caudal lung lobe that's retracting from the thoracic wall? And, and in fact, does this dog have have a new thorax? <laughs> Excuse me. And that, that, that that isn't what's happening here. Um, it's it's just uh, sort of a, a soft tissue boundary um, created by the fact that this this dog is, is quite so deep chested. So <laughs> so I, I agree that. Um, these margins are kind of um, kind of confusing, um, and uh, it's made all the more confusing by the existence of the pleural effusion, which um, is is preventing us from seeing any of the margins that we normally expect to see, so the heart um, and the diaphragm, um, and that's because we've got this infiltrate in the accessory lung lobe in this sort of region. Um, but I think I think it, it, it's certainly possible to pick up this this increase in opacity here. <laughs> Excuse me on these on these lateral views. So, um, I mean, normally we, we'd expect to sort of see just radially loosened uh, lung here, and we'd expect to see the borders of, of the caudal vena cava, and, and we just can't when we're in this left lateral. Um, so um, that that should should suggest to us that there's something going on here that is is abnormal. And um, if we think about where the accessory lung lobe is on on a lateral view, then it's it's, it's right here. So. Um, I, I kind of agree that these these are tricky films to to interpret. Um, I think uh, the things to take from it really would be um, the sort of changes that you'd expect to see in a patient that has um, a pleural effusion. So the effacement of the cardiac silhouette, the margins of the diaphragm, the um, pleural fissure lines, um, both in the lateral views and the dorsal ventral view. And really, um, just to remind us of our anatomy and, and do the accessory <laughs> And, and we need to find it in lateral radiographs, and, and, and it, it is here between the, the diaphragm and the cold border of the cardiac cell. Um, and yeah, it is possible to have a, a mobile pneumonia that just affects the accessory lung lobe, because that's that's exactly what this, this dog has. Um, it has a ventral distribution as well, which is, is typical of a pneumonia, um, rather than another disease etiology like um, uh, an edema, so a cardiogenic or cardiogenic edema, which would be more. So yeah, did you did you not think it was it was possible to get to get there just looking at the radiographs? No, I mean I don't know. I thought at the beginning it was some sort of um, diaphragmatic herniation from the right lateral, although it wasn't completely soft tissue opacity. Um, oh. Yeah. Because it looked like it looks like there was sort of mass effect, and the heart, I thought it was a bit more uh, cranially displaced. Yeah. And uh, the uh, well, parts of I don't know, the liver to me looks it, lo it looked a bit, you know, shrink. But <laughs> but then if you check the other views, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And, yeah. and yeah. also the quality of the x rays, they are quite, you know, underexposed. So I, I think it's quite. Tricky to be honest, too. Yeah, well, I agree. It's not um, not an easy set of films. Um, Definitely to, not. Um, but I mean, these you know these these are um, genuine films that were taken in, in first opinion practice, and this is you know, a real case that we've seen in the last um, month. And yeah, these are you know, films that um, I was asked to to help out with. 
And um, you know, it's it's nice that we have the the CT in this case um, because um, it, it it takes away any doubts that we have about what else might be going on. I mean, this this dog doesn't have a diaphragmatic hernia. It um, you know it, it doesn't have a soft tissue mass um, within the uh, within the cobraventral thorax. Um, it, it it's just that it it has the uh, consolidation of the accessory lumbar. <coughs> now, some some of you guys might think well. Um, I'm pretty confident that this uh, dog had um, pleural effusion on these radiographs, but I didn't really see any pleural effusion on the CT. Um, and that's a, a, a fair comment. And that's because um, there was a bit of a delay uh, between the radiographic study and um, the uh, CT study. Um, I think the dog was thracocentesed um, in between times as well. Um, so, so yeah, you, you can't really see much pleural effusion on um, the CT scan, just the consolidation of the accessory lumbar. That's because there was I think there was a good week between the uh, radiographic study um, and uh, the CT study. Um, I, th I think it was also thracocentes this dog, but it is it didn't have a huge volume of diffusion to begin with. So yeah, so I, I'll say things I'd like you guys to take away um, would be uh, the radiographic changes associated with pleural effusion. Um, just to, a reminder of um, what what lung modes exist um, and particularly where the accessory lung lobe is. Um, just a reminder of um, the fact that pneumonia has a, a ventral distribution rather than a high lower dorsal portal distribution. Um, if you see a bronchograms, then you can say that it's consolidation. Um, and um, in a young dog like this, then the differentials that you should consider would be um, something uh, infectious or, or can be aspiration in the exploits, <coughs> potentially something um, parasitic, but like I say, this doesn't really fit with, with lung. All right. <coughs> and we'll cough this again. All right. So, any other questions about number one? In which case, we will move on to case number two, uh, which is a four month old male entire boxer uh, that presents with an acute onset right fallen lingus. Uh, so, this is uh, more of an orthopedic case. And again, the radiographs that I've given you guys are the radiographs um, that were taken um, in the first instance um, in this patient. So, uh, I mean, we've got kind of a, a thorax really, um, but it, it does include um, the uh, shoulders. I'm difficult to know which is the left and which is the right shoulder. And we've then got a medial lateral view of the right forelimb, and then we've got a craniocaudal view of um, the antibrachian right left antibrachian. Um, and just them. So, anybody feeling in an orthopedic kind of need this evening? And again, this this um, isn't a complete study, and um, it certainly isn't a textbook study, um, because you know we we don't really have orthogonal views of any joint, and all of the views that we have include multiple joints. And certainly in one of the views, it's difficult to know uh, which joint is which, or to is which. So I'd be interested to know if you guys thought you could see anything suspicious in these radiographs that might be responsible for that right form of lens. <laughs> no, nobody. Nobody can see. Oh, two of us. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm happy for either one of you guys to um, just run me through what you think may or may not be going on here. Thanks, Nicoletta. Um, so I, there looks to be a uh, maybe a fracture at the distal humerus on that that view there. There certainly is something um, that looks a little bit abnormal, okay, but it's, it's, it's a bit difficult because of the, yeah, yeah, because of the brain <laughs> as well, so it's quite hard to, to okay. interpret in completeness. Um, but that, that that doesn't look quite right to me. Okay. But, oh, yeah. that's, um, that's, that's fair enough. Um, so one of the reasons why, yeah, this, this dog uh, is it, so difficult to interpret this study is, is it, because it's a very young dog. So it's got a whole bunch of of open um, physes. Um, so we've got 
this proximal hemophysis. This this is probably the, just the distal hemophysis. We've got more growth plates, um, and we can see them in um, all the different views. So it's difficult to know which of those are just growth plates and, and which of those um, might may not be fractures. So so I, I think that this is just the distal hemophysis here, and, and these are all, all physes. So anybody else have any other thoughts about what might be causing this beast's lameness? Well, at the level of the sh uh, shoulder joint, essentially there are irregular margins of the glenoid cavity and also on the cranial aspect of the humeral head. Uh, the margin looks quite irregular. Yeah. Um, potentially um, sort of um, a, a bit, um, it's not a proper motitan, but they are quite irregular and they are not smoothly marginated, essentially, what I would expect to find in a in a young dog, essentially. Yeah, no, I think that's 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 fair. Um, so so yeah, I, I was a little bit concerned about how irregular the um, margins of this I think, proximal humeral epiphysis looked uh, in this view. Um, is there anything else? Are there any other linear lucencies that any of you guys might have seen that might you might be concerned about? And, and I, I do agree with the Nicolata about this clean out as well. The, the margins do look a little bit in bad. I mean, can we get as far as saying that, that what we're concerned about here is is the shoulder, the right shoulder rather than the right elbow or the carpus or of the distal limbs. Are you guys happy that that we don't need to be looking down here at, at the carpi or the elbows? So in a dog of this age, I'd be suspicious of the the sort of like the um the the distal ulnar lesions that they can get. The name escapes me. Um, we used to see a lot of these a few years ago, but we don't see them so much now. But I'm not so they get a, a radiolucent line. They did absolutely, not, yeah. Absolutely. Um, 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 yeah, I, th I think maybe there is more of a radiolucent line um, at the distal on our growth plate on the right than the left. And they used to present febrile and yeah. a bit unwell. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so something like, like a metaphyseal osteopathy. Yeah, that, that's that's sort of, yeah I, I just couldn't yeah. get it. Metaphyseal yeah. osteopathy, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah do, just yeah. distal ulna. Yeah, yeah, and they were just hot and swollen and they had yeah. fe fevers. And there was all sorts of speculation about whether it was vitamin C deficiency, whether it was related to distemper. I yeah. don't know what the current theory is. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so it's a young dog, so something like that, something like a metaphyseal osteopathy um, is, is certainly worth considering. And as you said, typically they get this um, radiolucent halo just adjacent to the physis, and the predilection site would be um, the distal radial and ulnar physis. Um, so uh, I, I think um, these these physis are abundant. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that there is a radiolucent halo associated with um, the distal radial and ulnar physis. And it can be really tricky. And, and when I'm looking at these sorts of radiographs in these very young dogs, um, I often have to get the textbook out and, and, and have a look at what a, what a normal should look like um, to convince myself that there are any abnormalities there. And, um, and, and I think these, these distal levels are, are pretty. Um, so uh, the, the problem lies uh, further up. And the elbow, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with this as well. Um, and just, just like um, Nicoletta, my, my eye was sort of drawn to, to this shoulder. And um, the, the proximal humerus, um, particularly the margins, and, and as the cliff pointed out, the opacity is a little bit heterogeneous. And, Margins a little bit irregular. Um, the the other thing that I was slightly concerned about was with these these lucencies um, just just here. So there's this really faint radiolucent line that's just bisecting um, that distal right shoulder, and um, you can even convince yourself that there's uh, an additional linear lucency that is, is extending from the 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 oblique <laughs> bisecting that distal shoulder proximally up into the body of the scapula. Now, uh, what what makes this so tricky is is that I do think there's there's a lot of soft tissue swelling associated with this this right shoulder as well, and you've got a lot of margins um, that we can see as a result of, of the swelling in the soft tissues. So we've got some radiolucent margins here and here, and there's some radiolucent margins here. So 
is, is, this, is this real? Is, is this a fracture? Or um, is it is it just because of the swelling and it's just superimposition of some of the small and soft tissues that are just adjacent to this joint? So that's that, that's what I was um, con concerned about essentially. Is, this, is, is there a fracture? Um, so if you guys were. Let's do a CT. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could, do, you could do a CT. Um, so uh, what we what we did do in this case, um, or actually what the um, the primary care practitioner did in this case, was to repeat the radiographs. Um, and uh, I think the radiographs were repeated. I think it was at least ten days after these initial set of radiographs. But um, to get a complete set of shoulder radiographs, um, including um, orthogonal views. Uh, so uh, we can take a look at those now. <coughs> so this is this is the right shoulder. And this is the left shoulder. And then we've got um, the medial-lateral right and left shoulders uh, together. Um, so yeah, anybody like to comment on this additional set of films? So this is now uh, a much a much more uh, complete and a much higher quality study um, of just shoulder joints. So anybody have uh, any comments to make here? I can comment if you want. Yeah, go for it. Um, so on the right um, shoulder at the level of the, um, it's at the level of the, of the glenoid aspect essentially of the scapula, there is a well-defined uh, radiolucent line, yeah. um, which essentially run transverse to, to the scapula, and there is a potential um, as well um, focal increase opacity, a sort of sclerosis, mm, yeah, round, round, rounded shape, which is um, caudal um, to the um, spin of the scapula, essentially. Um, okay. And compared... Yeah. In comparison to the other, um, to the other, um, to the other shoulder, um, which it looks completely um, unremarkable. Yeah. Okay. So what what do we think? So um, I'm not sure if there there is a vascular channel. Um, however, I would probably put in differential diagnosis, um, fracture, um, I don't know if I would put that area potential um, uh, osteomyelitis, okay. inflammation, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, I mean, I, I never seen that area. Mm, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, now, I think, so one of the things to, to take away from this, I suppose, is just how useful it can be to um, repeat radiographs um, to 10 days uh, after you think you may have spotted a subtle fracture line. Um, and uh, also um, how useful it is to spend a little bit more time um, getting um, high quality radiographs and getting a complete study. Um, so um, getting uh, both limbs and orthogonal views, because then it means you can compare the two and be really confident um, about identifying your abnormalities. And you're absolutely right, there is there is this um, sort of uh, transverse, slightly oblique, um, linear area of radiolucency that's just bisecting that distal right scapula, um, just proximal to the glenoid cavity. And um, there is um, an area that looks a little bit sclerotic. Um, in, in fact, uh, the margins of this uh, linear lucency um, are a little bit indistinct. Um, I, I think there is uh, a um, defect in the caudal cortex there, so we can follow the margins, the caudal margins of the scapula um, proximally um, to, to this point, and then there's a bit of a gap, um, and then there's the rest of the body of the scapula. And um, I think what we're looking at here is um, a fracture. Um, I think the reason why 
the opacity is a little bit heterogeneous, the margins are a little bit rounded, it looks a little bit sclerotic, a little bit uh, loosened, um, is because this is now a, a chronic fracture, so you know, we're sort of 10, 14 days down the line from when um, this fracture happened, and, and it's it's a young dog, so it's it's all starting um, to heal up. Um, we've also got this, this yeah. little linear lucency here that's extended proximally into the body of, of, of the scapula. So I suspect that um, you know, this this little puppy was actually knocked over in the park by a much bigger dog. And um, we've got this, um, if we were being uh, comprehensive um, about describing it, it's it's a chronic, it's closed, it's non-articular, um, it's probably incomplete, it's predominantly oblique, um, it's the distal part of the right scapula um, and there could be just a little bit of distal displacement of the um, glenoid relative to the body of the scapula. But yeah, certainly um, a fracture here. Very tricky to see in, in the initial set of radiographs and very easy to see in um, the second set of radiographs. Um, and, and interestingly, um, the cranial part of that proximal right humerus in the second set of radiographs looks, looks fine, um, so it, it doesn't look um, irregular at all. Um, the opacity uh, looks normal and the margins look nice and smooth and normal as well. So yeah, so that was um, a really subtle, really tricky to see fracture of um, a scapula in, in a very young dog. And um, like I say, the, the the thing that I want you guys to take away from it is that if, if you do think you can see a fracture, so um, in, in, in this dog, you know, we could see these, these linear lucencies here, we're thinking, well, you know, are we are we confident enough to say that, that this dog definitely has a fracture based on the study that we have? And and the answer was well, not not entirely. Um, so we're, we're suspicious that this this right scapula is fractured, but really we want to see some additional radiographs and we want to see a complete study um, in order to really nail it on. And um, there was a little bit of a delay before uh, that got done. Um, which which also helped as well because it meant that this is a bit more of a chronic fracture and it means that there's some remodeling of the bones that are involved um, and it was much easier to see. So yeah, so this uh, this little puppy had um, a little fractured scapula, um, which was really tricky to see in the initial set of radiographs and then much easier to see um, in the second set um, when we've got um, uh, a, a complete study of a single joint, um, including um, orthogonal views in the contralateral room. Um, so yeah, super useful. Okay, any of you guys have any questions about case number two? All right, in which case, we move on to case number three, which is a four-year-old female neutered pug uh, with acute onset dyspnea. So we've got a right lateral, and we've got a dorsal ventral, and, and that's all we've got. So um, back on to thoracic films after just a, a brief pause into orthopedics. Um, anybody fancy just walking us through what they think might be going on in this little plug still works? <clears throat> Any tinkers at all? So four year old, it's a pug, it's got a cute onset dyspnea. If not, I can uh, I can run you through it. This is quite a nice case, so I, I would be interested to see what you guys think of it. Um, I can say I think it's got a pleural effusion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um so um, because there's a facement of the that we can't see the heart at all. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And and um, it looks like the lungs are, are pushed backwards. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of gas in the stomach, which could be aerophasia. Yeah. If it's obviously very dyspnea. We can't see the cranial border of the liver, but that could just be because of the fluid, which is making the borders difficult to see. Absolutely. Um, so um, the, it's very difficult to interpret the cranial thorax because um, obviously, the, there's fluid there which is obscuring things. We can see the trachea and we can see it's got an endotracheal tube, so the dog's anaesthetised. Um, yep. um, on the dorsal ventral, what is it once again? Um, there's, there's the facement of all the structures. We can't see um, the heart at all. Yep. 
um, and we can't see the diaphragm. Um, and once again, there's a lot of um, um, gas in the stomach. But I'm afraid yep. I think that's about as much as I can say. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that you're absolutely right. So, so this dog definitely has a, a pleural effusion. So. Um, as you said, the face of the cardiac silhouette, the face of the margins of the diaphragm. Um, we're not really seeing um, any convincing fissures, certainly not on, on the DV. I think we could probably say that this, this can be a little fissure line, you know, just super improves of the way we expect the cardiac silhouette to be. Um, so the other things I'd comment on would be the opacity of these cranial lung lobes. Um, so this is, this is our left cranial lobe here. This DV view is, is, is pretty bleak, um, so this, this skin should really be nicely superimposed on the thoracic vertebra. Um, so, so very oblique, um, but it, it does look as if this uh, right cranial lung lobe um, is abnormal as well. So it's it's increased in opacity. Um, this this little margin here um, is, is probably a little lumbar sign. So if you have a lung lobe that's full of infiltrate um, and it's consolidated, then it's going to be more radio opaque. And if that lung lobe that's full of infiltrate is sitting next to a lung lobe that is full of gas, um, then you get a margin just like that, which is called a, a lumbar sign. So I wonder whether that's a little lumbar sign there between the left cranial and the left caudal lung lobe. It's difficult to really be confident about whether or not there's a lumbar sign affecting um, the right cranial lung lobe and between the right cranial and the right middle, just because it's a view of the frequency. So absolutely pleural effusion and potentially some consolidation of um, both the left and the right cranial lung lobes. So um, given that this is a four-year-old pug um, and it's got a key onset this year, um, what, what sort of things might you guys be considering in, in the patient presenting like this? Are there any differentials that, that might spring to mind? And the one that, that I was thinking of really in, in this patient, given that it's a pug and um, given that it has acute onset dyspnea, would be something potentially like, like a lung lobe torsion. Um, so uh, lung lobe torsions, um, you see them in uh, little dogs like pugs and typically in little dogs like pugs, um, the cranial lung lobes are affected. So we have left cranial most commonly, but the right cranial can be affected as well. And in big deep chested dogs, um, like um, say the Doberman that um, we looked at earlier, um, it tends to be the right middle lung lobe. And the sort of radiographic changes that you get with the lung lobe torsion include a pleural effusion. Um, and um, I think you can get all sorts of different effusion, the types of effusion with the lung lobe torsion. So they can be chylus or they can be neurologic or, or anything. Um, the affected lung lobe, because it's it's twisted, it gets bigger um, and the um, lobar bronchus tapers and um, could be in an abnormal position. So um, you'd expect to see the affected lobar bronchus in, in uh, either shortened or in a strange place or, or both. And because the lung lobe um, twists um, then um, and it's full of gas, the gas that's in the twisted lobe um, tends to sort of escape into the interstitium um, rather than remain within the um, bronchi. And so you get um, emphysematous type change within the affected lung lobe as well. Uh, so those are the sort of changes that we expect to see in a, in a dog with a lung lobe torsion. Now, um, I mean, in terms of whether this could be a lung lobe torsion, there's, there's certainly things about it that, that fit. Um, it's a pug um, and certainly pugs um, are overrepresented for lung lobe torsions. And it got very dyspneic very quickly. Um, so that kind of fits with the lung lobe torsion as well. It does have a pleural effusion, um, which, which fits with a lung lobe torsion. Um, not really seeing any evidence of, of emphysematous type change. And, and that really just looks like kind of speckly gas lucency um, within the affected lobe. So um, typically um, in, in a pug, because it's the cranial lobes, you'd see it in this sort of area here, and it's like a speckling gas lucency. Not, not really seeing that, but we are seeing consolidation of um, the left and the right cranial lobes. Um, and it's usually the cranial lobes, particularly the left cranial, that are affected in pugs with um, lung lobe torsion. Um, now we, we can see the right cranial lobar bronchus here, and we can kind of see the left cranial lobar bronchus here as well. And they don't really look like they're tapering prematurely and, and they don't really look like they're in an abnormal position either. Um, and even though 
these cranial lung lobes look like they're a bit consolidated. Um, they don't really look like they're any bigger than they should be either. So they're, they're kind of a normal size. So th there are things about this dog that, that fit with the lung lobe torsion um, and, and kind of things that, that don't. Um, so we probably need to do something else to, to try and decide exactly what's going on. Um, and you can use ultrasound to uh, look for that emphysematous type change that you see in the affected lobes. Um, so that's something that you could do um, in practice if you had a patient that um, you thought might have a lobe torsion, you didn't have access to CT. But in, in this dog, um, we, we did a CT. So before I show you guys um, the CT, um, is, is everybody kind of happy with um, our description of these radiographs? Does anybody have anything else that they, they'd like to add? Case, which will show you the CT. So we're going to look at um, uh, two sequences um, for this dog. So we'll look at a, a lung reconstruction initially, um, and then we'll look at um, a, a pre-contrast soft tissue reconstruction. So this is this is our lung reconstruction. So again, starting cranial, moving cordially and moving into the lung. All right, so I'm going to stop it there and just get my pointer up. So so this is this is right cranial lung lobe. This is this is a bronchus here. This is on the left cranial lobe. So We'll do is we'll just sort of skim back and forth and I just want you guys to kind of keep an eye on on the the lobar bronchi really because if if either of these lung lobes are torsed then those bronchi should should taper so any lung lobe that, that's twisted you're not going to see a contiguous bronchus extending from the hilus into that lung lobe because it's all twisted up so you what you'll see is, is a bronchus that the tapers terminates prematurely and then all of the lung lobe beyond that is going to be big and it's going to be emphysematous and that's really where you get your diagnosis of, of lung lobe torsion. So if you, if you keep an eye on, on those bronchi, I'll just sort of move backwards and forwards so we can get a really nice view of the right cranial lobe our bronchus there and, and I mean this is certainly not normal, I mean that, that lung lobe is, is consolidated so that's a, that's a huge ear bronchogram really that we're looking at here but it, it doesn't look torsed. Um, I can follow that bronchus right the way back to the hilus and it looks absolutely fine. And again, I'm just looking at, so I can't, I can't scroll with the, C, with the CT and use my laser pointer at the same time. So I'm just looking at the, um, the right cranial lobar bronchus again. I'm just going to follow it. It goes all the way back. You can see it just terminated there at the hilus. And then we'll do the same for the left cranial lobar bronchus. So we're just, we're just sort of here at the hilus. And we're going to move cranially and just follow it all the way to the tip of that lung lobe and, and they they look fine i mean those, those lung lobes are consolidated just as we suspected based on that dv uh, view um but they, they don't really look towards um there, there's certainly some effusion here as well um but no more than that and if we look at the rest of the lung and just like in that dogma, um there is some consolidation of the accessory uh, lung lobe as well so there's some bronchograms in that accessory lung lobe it's called lung lobes don't look too bad. Ian, sorry, yes. there is an hyperintense sort of mineral attenuation mm, uh, structure. Is. Yeah, is, is it the drainage or? No, so this this dog. No, this is another. Yeah, okay. so <laughs> so Nicoletta uh, is uh, is getting uh, ahead of the game here and uh, is thinking, well, if this dog doesn't have a lung lobe torsion, then yes. why does it have a pleural effusion? And, and again, we, we we drained this dog's chest before we went into CT, so there is an effusion here, but it's I mean, it's a lot less than it looks on the radiographs. And it doesn't look like this dog has a lung lobe torsion, despite the fact that it's a pug and it has consolidated cranial lung lobes and it's presenting with a key onset dysmorphia. So um, let's take a look at um, the uh, pre-contrast soft tissue reconstruction. So yeah, let me again, for those of you who are not used to looking at CTs, see how it looks a little bit different um, in terms of the attenuation relative to the lung. And that's because the rendering width and level is slightly different in order to assess the soft tissues rather than the lung structures. So I'll just play it, play it through. So this is essentially the, the same sequence, but with a different reconstruction algorithm. So uh, with a soft tissue reconstruction algorithm, uh, makes it easier for us to look at the soft tissues. And as Nicoletta has pointed out, there is a structure here that shouldn't be there. So 
this this little high per attenuating structure shouldn't be there. This this dog hasn't had any chest rings placed. Um, it, it has. There's no reason for that structure to be there. What what is that structure? Is is the question that we need to ask? And I'm just going to play it through now, and I just want you guys just to kind of follow that structure right right the way from the cranial part of the thorax um, to the caudal part of the thorax, and it goes all the way along. Okay, you can still see it just there, and right the way to there, essentially, right there. So we've got this this pug, and it's got. Um, quite a large volume fluid effusion. It's got consolidation of its left cranial and its right cranial lung lobes. It doesn't have a lung lobe torsion, as far as we can tell, and it's got this uh, this linear hyper attenuating structure extending right the way from the cranial thorax at the level of the first word, right the way to the end of the thorax. This thing I want you guys to to keep to keep in mind. All the way back. To the caudal thorax. So I guess my question for you guys now is what what is that thing? What could that be? Any any suggestions? And what we can do if penetrating for a body by two, I don't know. It's... Yeah, so just to convince you guys that this is real, we'll take a look at some ultrasound images as well. So uh, seeing a really big linear, hyper attenuating linear structure within the chest is, is not something that happens very often. And, and certainly I've never seen anything like this before, but this is what that structure looked like on ultrasound. So um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of what's going on here, I've, I've just I've got the probe in between the ribs um, and I'm on the right side, which is where I can see that structure. And I'm just looking for it. So I can see this, this linear hyper attenuating structure um, just here. And it's just sat within pure space. That's how it looks in, in short axis. Um, so, so this is this is sort of pleural space here. This is all pleural effusion. This is this is the structure that we can see on the CT, and we've got um, quite a lot of associated acoustic shadowing. And I think I've got a little video of this as well. Yeah, I do. And, and, and that, that's how it looked in sort of real time during the ultrasound scan. So, yeah. Any any other? So, so Nicoletta said, could this be a penetrating? Uh, injury a penetrating foreign body and yeah I, I guess it absolutely could um but that, that doesn't really fit with with the history really so this dog doesn't have any history of uh, trauma um this this was a dog that um, funnily enough actually had some gastrointestinal signs um a couple of weeks prior to the onset of the acute dyspnea um so had it been seen at its primary care practice um for vomiting and cranial abdominal pain um, I think 10 to 14 days prior to presenting with dyspnea and the large volume of fusion. So any any other suggestions for what this might be? And what to do next? I mean, what 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 do we do next in this dog? So I mean, what we did essentially was to do an exploratory thoracotomy. And, and what we found uh, in this dog was a big old kebab stick. Um, so this is this is the kebab stick just here, and uh, our surgeon who did the exploratory thoracotomy had a good girdle around the cranial abdomen as well, um, and uh, could find some evidence that this kebab stick had migrated from the duodenum. Um, it had gone through the duodenum and through the liver and through the diaphragm and ended up in the right pleural space. Um, so this dog had. Um, uh, it, was, it was a hemothorax essentially. So when we drained that fluid effusion, it was very bloody. Um, so it had a hemothorax and it had consolidation of its right and left cranial lung lobes, secondary to a uh, migrating linear wooden foreign body that had come from its GI. Um, so it's kebab stick. So this this dog had a kebab stick in its chest. It did not have a lung lobe torsion, um, which yeah was pretty unexpected to be honest. Um, so I I was. Uh, expecting a lung lobe torsion and what we got was a kebab stick in the pleural space. So yeah, I thought I'd share that one with you um, because it's pretty unusual. Um, I've not seen uh, any um, migrating GI foreign bodies in the chest before. Um, I've, I've certainly seen kebab sticks um, just 
in, in the peritoneal cavity, I'm in the abdomen, um, and sometimes I've seen them incidentally. So um, these dogs, you know, they eat the kebab stick, they eat, eat the kebab, eat the kebab stick, and then over time, this this kebab stick just sort of migrates out of the gastrointestinal tract and then just sort of sits in the peritoneal cavity and not really doing anything. Um, but I've I've never seen one migrate into the chest. Um, so yeah, I thought I would share that with you. So um, I guess the the question is, well, can you see it? Can you see it on the radiographs? And that's that's um, just a single image that I've taken from from the CT scan. So this is this is a dorsal uh, reconstruction um, of the thorax in this dog, and, and this is a structure that we were looking at on the CT. So this is that linear structure extending right the way from the cranial thorax, right the way to um, the caudal thorax, um, and that's that's where it was sitting. Um, and this is this is the DV radiograph. And and I, I'm not convinced you can see it. Uh, the, the, the only thing that I mean, there, there is this this kind of linear looking shadow just here. I'm, I'm not really convinced that that's what it is. Um, but yeah, kind of fun to, to look at the CT image and the dorsal ventral radiograph together and see if you can convince yourself that, um, that you can see that structure. But I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced you can see it. And certainly a kebab stick in the plural space was not on my differential list when, um, when I looked at the radiographs. Um, and honestly, um, when um, this dog went through the ball um, when we did the CT initially. But it's a really fun case. Um, so yeah, I thought I would share that with you guys. Um, so anyone have any questions about number three? In which case we will move on to number four, which uh, is a 10 year old male neutered large crossbreed. Um, it's presented to you as vomiting. And uh, we've got, I think, just two radiographs. So we've got a lateral radiograph, a right lateral radiograph, and we've got a dorsal ventral radiograph. So yeah, this one um, is a little bit more uh, kind of straightforward than what you would expect. So anybody fancy taking this one? This is an older dog, 10 years old. Uh, it's quite a big dog. Um, it's like a big, big point across. And uh, yeah, it's vomiting. Anybody like to share their thoughts on what might be going on here? This be something. And this is this is absolutely the sort of case that that you're going to see um, in in primary care practice. No, no, no takers. Um, it, it looks it, it looks like again there's maybe some free fluid in the abdomen because there's um quite a, there's some loss of detail okay. and um we've got um some dilated loops of intestine yeah um, which look um looking at it looks um larger than the um vertebral body of l5 and yeah. um, i think if it's if it's double it's um, very suggestive of a foreign body. Yeah, yeah. So I would be very worried that this dog is a foreign body. Yeah, no, I think um, I think that's uh, that that's fair. So uh, there's certainly a whole bunch of small bowel here that is is filled with gas, and um, the distribution of the small bowel is is quite abnormal as well. So um, we've got uh, quite a bit of bowel up in the craniodorsal abdomen we wouldn't really expect it to be up here normally. <coughs> Excuse me, normally. And uh, not, not only that, um, but we've got this sort of stacking of, of the small bowel as well. So we've got several um, dilated segments of small bowel all stacked up together. And again, that's something um, that I'd be um, pretty concerned about, something that quite often is associated with a um, mechanical ileus secondary to a gastrointestinal foreign body. Um, and um, absolutely, the more dilated the loops of small bowel, the more likely it is um, that the patient is obstructed. Uh, and, you, and you can absolutely compare it to the height of about five. Um, the the thing that I think is most important is 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 there a, is there a big differential between between different populations of small bowel? So can you see two distinct populations of small bowel, and is one markedly more dilated? than the other and if, if the answer is is yes to both of those questions then again I, I think the possibility for mechanical illness is much more likely and um, now um, we've, we've sort of got a, a, a bunch of dilated loops of, of what we think is small bowel because part of the problem with these radiographs is trying to be confident about what's small bowel and what's large bowel 
we can't really see the coral um, with any amount of confidence here. So um, really, we just thinking that all, all of these segments of small of barrel are all, all small barrel, and they all just look, look kind of dilated. Um, in the DV, we, we can see this this big loop of barrel over here, which is is probably you know, this 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 mark is, is incorrect. Um, it's probably not colon. That, that's probably small barrel. Um, we see them, and then this is that big bunch of, of um, small barrel that's all stacked and um, located in the, um, the left cranial dorsal abdomen. So it's in a kind of a funny location as well. Um, in terms of the loss of spherosal detail, I don't think it actually looks too bad um, on, on this lateral. Um, and we can still see you know, the margins of the spleen and, and the stomach. Um, in, the, in the DV view, it's, it's difficult to make out um, any specific abdominal organs, but because that, that's because it's a DV view and then we often get really poor cerosal detail in the DV rather than the DV view. Um, the other thing is, 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 is this, this area just here. So we've got this focal area of heterogeneous radio opacity, um, which we still don't know what, what that is, and it, it could absolutely be um, a foreign body. And the fact that we've got this area of, of heterogeneous opacity, and um, we've got dilated segments of small bowel, and we've got stacking of the small bowel, um, and we've got um, small bowel in, in an abnormal location, um, mean that um, a foreign body and um, an associated mechanical illness is, is really likely um, in this dog. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I uh, I guess my question to you guys is, is, what would you do next? Would you just cut this dog based on these radiographs? Would you do an ultrasound? Um, would you maybe take some more radiographs a little bit down the line? It might be some of you guys that, that have a lot of barium to, to get used. You might want to do a contrast study um, or, or an ultrasound. I mean, I, I think that given the dog's presentation and given the changes on these radiographs, it, it, it would be perfectly reasonable to cut this dog based on the changes that we can see. Um, but that, that isn't what happened. Um, the, dog, the dog did get a CT. Um, and I, I'm not uh, convinced that it was necessarily the right thing to do here, but it does mean that we can take a look at an abdominal CT, abdominal CT um, and compare it to the radiographs that we've looked at. So this is, this is a post-contrast uh, soft tissue reconstruction of, of an abdomen. And what we're looking at here is the cranial abdomen. We've got this, this is the stomach here. So already stomach is, is super big. Um, and this is um, this is a, a, a dorsal horizontal border caused by kind of a gas cap. So this, this is a gas cap uh, within the gastric fundus. And this is all sort of fluid um, that's in the remainder of the stomach. We run that on. And as we move through the abdomen, and hopefully you guys can see all of those big all those big dilated loops of, of small bowel. And, and here, particularly, you can see on the CT that there is, there are two distinct populations of small bowel. So we've got small bowel that's pretty empty, and then we've got small bowel that is, is very dilated. Um, so again, um, that, that, that makes us even more confident that this patient um, is, is obstructed and it has an account of this. Uh, so I guess the, the question is, well, can we actually see the, the foreign body in, in the CT? And, and you, you can, um, it is, it is pretty tricky, um, and if I remember correctly, uh, the foreign body um, was, was in the ilium, so it's on the right side. So, so what I want you guys to do is just to keep an eye on on this bit of bowel, just just here. So this is this is, this bit of bowel is quite quite dilated, and just as I move forward, I just want you to kind of follow that, and then we start to see this this very kind of heterogeneous looking structure within the lumen. And then as we move on, this thing just continues. There's lots of it. And then the bowel gets really small. So here. So we'll just run through that again. So we've got really dilated bit of bowel here. We've got a bunch of heterogeneous material within the lumen, which is just here. And then beyond that, so um, so ab, ab or right to that, if we if we follow it, then the bowel gets super small. So that's that's the bowel that's that's ab or right to it. Um so so yeah, this this dog absolutely has um, a foreign body. Um it's got a whole bunch of um, dilated loops of uh, small bowel that are full of 
fluid and gas and ORAD um, to whatever this, this structure is um, in the lumen uh, of the uh, ileum, I believe it turned out to be just, just there. Um, and then it's got a very empty bowel just out of the water to that. So yeah, absolutely the right thing to do to take this dog to surgery. In, in, interestingly, um, Alison was absolutely right about uh, there being um, some uh, effusion and um, some peritonitis. Um, so, so there is absolutely a small volume peritoneal effusion here, um, and there is some evidence of peritonitis. So this, this streaky hyperattenuation you can see in the peritoneal fat, um, that's, that's evidence of inflammation. Um, so, so there absolutely was a small volume peritoneal effusion and um, some peritonitis. So this dog um, had an X lap. Um, and this thing was a, was a fabric foreign body um, that was um, stuck in the room. Um, and yeah, it was absolutely obstructed and um, yeah, needed to go to surgery. So yeah, this is a nice case uh, because it's a really nice example of the sort of changes that uh, you typically see in an abdominal radiograph in a patient that has a foreign body and a mechanical ileus. Um, so we can, we, can, we can see this structure here, which, which uh, is very abnormal and that's, our, that's what turned out to be our foreign body and all these dilated loops of small bowel that are stacked and abnormally distributed. And uh, yeah, we, we can see how that looks on a CT as well, which is uh, why I thought this case was, was kind of fun. And you don't often um, get, get to uh, see um, radiographs of, of a patient's abdomen and be able to compare it directly with a CT of their abdomen. Um, they have uh, foreign bodies and um, a and mechanical ileus. Um, so but this is one of those cases, um, and yeah, that's what it looks like. So I thought I'd share it with you guys. So yeah, that I think is uh, case number four. So that's all of our cases. Um, I've, I've run over ever so slightly, um, so apologies for that. Um, anybody have any questions um, about uh, case number four or any of our cases this evening? Uh, if not, then I will wish you... Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. It's not for tonight. Do you remember? We did a um, film reading, I think it was in June, and there was this dog with, uh, they were poorly marginated nodules in the lungs. Yes. And he went for post-mortem, and apparently yeah. they found uh, parasitic larvae. No, so yeah, so so the 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 case that you're talking about, um, the, the suspected parasitic larvae were, um, were thought to be seen on impression smears that were made of the lungs prior to being sent for post-mortem. Um, so that, that dog did go for post-mortem and it, it didn't have lung room. Um, it, it did end up having neoplasia. Um, and it was, if I remember rightly, a really aggressive uh, round cell neoplasia um, okay. affecting the lungs and the pleura and the heart, I think. Um, and that was a really unfortunate dog because it was, it was only two years old. Um, yeah, it was three but yeah, years. Yeah, but it was, it was neoplastic. So, so at okay. the time, um, neoplasia was absolutely top five differentialist. Um, despite the fact that you know, this dog was very young, um, but because it was so young, we were considering other potential differentials, um, including lungworm, um, and we thought, well, you know, could this be lungworm? Uh, turns out, no, it, it wasn't. It, it, it was, in fact, um, something sinister, a neoplastic and nasty, horrible, aggressive brain cell tumor. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, um, any other questions about uh, any of tonight's cases? Uh, if not, then um, yeah, I thank you all again for joining me. Um, I hope um, that uh, you enjoyed um, discussing um, some of the more interesting cases that I've 